Good morning. Um, my mom always tells me before I speak publicly that I should think of everyone in the audience as my friend, so that's what I'm thinking. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. It's a real privilege, and I appreciate uh, Megan Ford's uh, help in, in setting things up and Aaron Kesselheim's outreach and the committee's outreach, um, inviting me to participate and share my two cents. And so that's, that's what you'll get. Uh, in, in addition to my role as principal investigator of an FDA-funded Searcier Center of Excellence, I also chair one of the FDA's advisory committees, the Peripheral and Central Nervous System Advisory Committee. But these thoughts are all my own, of course, and don't reflect those of Johns Hopkins nor the FDA. And I'm going to focus just on chronic non-cancer pain. I'll assume that, uh, that there's agreement that opioids serve a really valuable role for the treatment of acute pain and pain with active cancer and palliative care of pain at the end of life. And you know, these issues are really urgent. I hope I don't have to convince you of that. I have to be totally candid and say that I was a little um, nervous about the committee's charge because it referenced frameworks and models and formal methods. And that even that makes me concerned about whether the immediacy and gravity of the epidemic is being matched by an effective and timely regulatory response. Uh, the FDA has grappled with these issues for a very long time. Um, this graphic superimposes a variety of FDA regulatory actions on age-adjusted rates of mortality per 100,000. So the y-axis is from 0 to 10, and the x-axis is from 1999 to 2014. And I've highlighted in red uh, just the overall opioid deaths, and these are you know, you can decompose these from prescription and non-prescription opioids, but bottom line is there's been a lot of different regulatory activities, OxyContin label change in 01, public health advisories, abuse deterrent formulations approved, industry working group stakeholder meetings, launch of the safe use initiative, FDA support for a PDMP center of excellence, an FDA advisory committee on ADFs, new draft guidance on ADFs, and so on and so forth. And I, as uh, you have seen a slide already this morning that depicts uh, sales of opioids, and it's already been stated, but it's worth reinforcing that morbidity and mortality at an aggregate level are highly correlated with sales. So I could just as well be providing a time series or a plot of sales rather than overdose deaths. I'm not trying to make a causal claim here, but I am trying to make a point. So I'm not trying to make a, a causal claim about the role of any one of these. And of course, as an epidemiologist, I can always say yes, and there's always the counterfactual. Uh, but I do think it, it speaks for itself with respect to raising the question as to whether or not regulatory responses thus far have helped, and if so, how. So I'm going to speak about three different, I organize my comments into three different sections. So first, the issue of balance. The need for balance has often been emphasized when discussing the epidemic, and I think it actually showed up in the charge as well, primarily out of concern that efforts to reduce the overuse of opioids will have unintended effects on uh, patients with pain. And I think this is a premise worth questioning. Uh, it's not clear to me that there's a direct conflict between reducing opioid overuse and better regulating opioids on the one hand and improving the care for patients in pain on the other. And in other words, what I'm saying is, uh, to some degree, I don't think there's any conflict between population and individual, and in that we don't need to think about a population level framework for this reason. Uh, it's true that common non-cancer pain is very uh, is common. Common, uh, uh, cro I'm sorry, chronic non-cancer pain is common, and causes tremendous suffering and disability. And uh, but it's not clear to me how improved regulation of opioids jeopardizes the care of these patients. In fact, many patients with chronic non-cancer pain have opioid use disorders. So, um, and this is a point worth emphasizing because historically, some have argued that we have two populations of patients. Uh, Nora Volkow talked about narratives, and this was a, has been a prominent narrative that on the one hand, we have patients that abuse opioids and need to be kept away from them at all costs, and on the other, we have a patient population of uh, uh, legitimate pain patients that as one uh, pharmaceutical spokesperson said in the late 1990s, need access to our best, strongest pain medicines. And this is a false dichotomy. Um, so 
A another point that I think is important for the committee to consider is considering how commonly objections have been made to clinical, regulatory enforcement or other efforts to reduce the overuse of opioids on the grounds that they will harm those with chronic pain. It's remarkable that there's such a paucity of evidence demonstrating that. Uh, I'm not aware of any, and I've done literature searches other than convenience samples, internet convenience samples that demonstrate the unintended consequences of interventions to reduce opioid overuse. So despite this time and time again, what one hears is that efforts to, you, one hears objections to efforts to improve uh, opioid safety and reduce overuse that are predicated either on a false dilemma, that is that there's a dilemma between reducing overuse and improving care for patients with chronic pain, or a false dichotomy, or what is not uncommonly a false dichotomy, I should say. I'm not suggesting that all chronic pain patients have opioid use disorders, far from it. But, but I do think that there's a not uncommon false dichotomy, which is uh, th that those living with chronic pain are separate from those that may have opioid use disorders. The second uh, point that I want to speak to is the re re regulatory review and approval and monitoring of opioids. And this process has to take place in the context in which the products are used. And we're simply living in a really different world than we were 20 years ago. So my question for the committee is, should the review and approval process and evidentiary thresholds for access be the same as they were 20 years ago? And to me, there's a very clear answer to this question, which is absolutely not. But I think that it's important that the committee reach agreement about whether or not this is the case. So you've already heard some about the effectiveness of opioids, but I just want to underscore that while we know that they're effective relative to placebo or NSAIDs in reducing short-term pain, and improving functional status, there's been a, a remarkably little investigation of long-term opioid use. And the study quality has been low, the duration of follow-up limited, and the few randomized trials longer than six weeks have generally had very poor results. Um, se several studies have demonstrated that daily chronic opioid use may re uh, worsen pain and functioning, and at least one-third of patients in many clinical studies stop the product because of adverse events. These studies also generally are very enriched. They're enriched for patients that are less likely to experience adverse events, such as addiction or non-medical use. And of course, there's very close monitoring and supervision that doesn't reflect uh, the, the settings in which the products are used in the real world. <coughs> And so while we have some, we have little evidence of their long-term effectiveness and uh, a, a trove of evidence about the safety, I'm not going to say anything more about that other than to say I, I came in a little bit uh, after Dr. Volkow started, and I don't know if she said uh, this, although she has uh, um, discussed this in other settings, but all of the safety concerns, none of them should come as a great surprise because if you look at the organic structure of opioids, they're remarkably similar to heroin. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that they have similar clinical pharmacology and similar abuse liability as heroin. So the committee's been asked, or I've been asked, to speak to the importance of a new framework. And to me, this feels a little academic, quite frankly. I, I'm not convinced that we need a new framework. I think that we need better designed studies and evidentiary thresholds that match what we know of product risks and benefits. So I'm talking about more representative populations, greater external validity, study designs such as pragmatic and registry randomized trials that include longer follow-up, and safety endpoints that reflect the known risks of the products. These thresholds should be in place for market access. The horse is out of the barn, as the past decade demonstrates, once the products are approved for market. So one complicating issue here is that opioids are commonly diverted, and I've got to say I was um, very interested in Peter Lurie's uh, presentation. I thought it was very elegant, and I learned a lot, and um, I guess I wish I had seen it a few days ago. But, but what I'll say, I'll speak briefly to the issue of diversion, and I think uh, Peter addressed this also as one of the ways that um, opioids raise perhaps a, a set of distinct issues. I mean, I don't think the uh, uh, statin that my mom may take is commonly diverted to other people in a retirement community. Um, but, but, and, and this is the issue, of course, because the, the, the statutory uh, language focuses on conditions of use prescribed or recommended or suggested within the label. But you heard from Peter a dozen different ways that the agency has latitude and flexibility in applying these statutory standards. 
and pre-approval, it's not at all uncommon. I mean, virtually every advisory committee that I've sat on, the question has come up regarding various questions about whether or not clinicians and patients will use the product as it's labeled. So it's not at all uncommon to ask or discuss and for the FDA to take into account uh, questions regarding, for example, a product that may require clinical or laboratory testing, or a product that has an absolute contraindication in a subpopulation, such as pregnant women. Products have been pulled from the market specifically because they were not able to be used consistent with the label. The label was fine. Uh, and in the population, people weren't using it consistent with the label. People were dying. Product was pulled from the market. So in post-approval, these are precisely the types of concerns that led Congress to give the FDA expanded REMS authorities. So this authority gives the FDA great latitude in ensuring the safety of product use. And it could be used to require any number of more restrictive regulations to improve opioids risk benefit balance, ranging from mandating prescriber training to mandating PDMP use, prescription drug monitoring programs to requiring various risk mitigation measures be applied to eligible or high risk patients and the like. So these are, um, these compose a burden, there's no question, and the committee can consider that. There's a subset of REMS called ETASUs, elements to assure safe use, and we can discuss um, what that would look like. But the bottom line is, um, you've heard from uh, Dr. Sadie, and I couldn't agree more, this is a total outlier. You have 165,000 people that are dead from the products. Uh, maybe this is one where uh, a more restrictive REMS is uh, both consistent with the FDA mission and also within their statutory authority. So the last uh, comments focus on abuse deterrent formulations, that's ADFs, PMR, post-marketing requirements, and COIs, conflicts of interest, of course. So abuse deterrent formulations are one of the front lines here, and both the FDA and manufacturers are approaching these with great zeal. And I have concern about these products, uh, especially the most common type of ADFs, which are pills that have physical barriers to prevent tampering. And these re-engineered medicines may be designed to thwart abuse, but they're no less addictive. Uh, people, figure work, people figure out workarounds. Most people that are addicted or use the products non-medically swallow them whole. And our own research suggests that many prescribers have important misconceptions about their safety. Furthermore, making pills harder to crush doesn't make them any more effective for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. So I was particularly surprised when the FDA announced recently that they would hold an advisory committee for any new approval that was not an abuse deterrent formulation, since these formulations are the products that I would argue are most in need of the additional scrutiny and accountability that an advisory committee could provide. Second, uh, briefly about the FDA label and PMRs. So the label is obviously vital because it restricts marketing and promotion. The FDA has been petitioned to bring the label into greater alignment with the evidence base, and while they agreed to some changes, they resisted the most important ones, which are establishing a maximum daily dose and duration of use. The label, of course, doesn't constrain prescribers. Prescribers can still prescribe according to best standards and the like. I, I assume all of you are aware of that. But the reason that the label change is so important is because it does constrain marketing and promotion, and there are clear dose and duration dependent risks of these products. And the absence of evidence to indicate a favorable risk benefit balance beyond these thresholds is clear. So we don't need a new framework to manage this. The FDA already has a powerful tool that it should be using, which is federal law, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. This law limits the promotion of pharmaceutical products to conditions when use is demonstrated to be safe and effective. And if the law were properly applied, the label would better reflect the science and opioid makers would be prohibited from promoting opioid use for chronic non-cancer pain. So instead of decisively modifying the label, 38 months ago, the FDA issued a PMR. We've already heard about it some, and I've requested that the uh, language of the PMR be supplied, uh, provided to all of you. So these PMRs uh, required studies to demonstrate quantitative estimates of the risks of misuse, abuse, addiction, overdose, and death associated with long-term opioid use for chronic pain. There were a host of other requirements of these studies, including the assessment of how dozens of other variables, ranging from product and formulation to genetics and everything in between, confound, modify, or mediate the associations of interest. 
the associations of interest. So my question for the committee, and I think that this was asked a little bit uh, in a different way of the FDA earlier, of FDA colleagues earlier, what fundamental new knowledge have we learned from these mandated studies? And how have these studies reduced the number of Americans dying or developing addiction or opioid use disorders from these products? So I can't answer these questions, and I think one would also be hard-pressed to identify how such lessons have been in turn incorporated into effective regulation. So I'm not suggesting that PMRs don't have any role to play, but I do believe their ability to constrain the safe use of these products has been remarkably limited, and I'm not aware of any evidence to suggest otherwise. And for good reason, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act requires drug companies to prove that a product is safe and effective for specific indications before being allowed to promote that product's use. So the FDA should start enforcing this law now rather than waiting for the results of PMRs to come in and be incorporated into the label. So lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss the issue of financial conflicts of interest. And this is important because there's billions of dollars at stake, and where you stand on these issues depends upon where you sit. And we analyzed levels of support for the CDC opioid guidelines from organizations submitting comments to the docket and characterized how these positions were associated with funding from opioid manufacturers. While 81% of 158 organizations were supportive, opposition was three to six-fold more common among those with funding from manufacturers, whether overall or when examining recommendations regarding dosing or duration limits. So this is relevant because this affects the regulation of these products as well. The same objections by the same parties are made regarding tighter regulations as have been made regarding the CDC's guidelines and any number of other initiatives to reduce injuries and deaths. So in closing, I want to say that I, uh, during the past decade, the FDA has gone remarkable transformation, and uh, you know I want to be sure to be clear that I'm uh, always pleased to work with the FDA. I believe a lot in the mission and promise of the organization. But when it comes to opioids, I do think that there are several concrete steps that could have been taken and should have been taken a long time ago that haven't been. Um, and, and just imagine if a class of antibiotics or contraceptives was associated with more than 16,000 deaths last year. Can you imagine the magnitude of public outrage and FDA mobilization that would ensue? So the FDA hasn't been silent on these issues, but when it comes to the outcomes that matter most to Americans, I think that it's clear that there's a lot more that the agency can do. So thanks again for inviting me to share my thoughts.